This segment is brought to you by Jig Masters. Step up your game with high quality performance jigs, spinner baits, buzz baits, and more from JigMasters.com. And always, when in doubt, get the jig out. Welcome to the Bass Kayak and Beers podcast on the Paddle and Fin Network. On this podcast, we'll be talking about life and kayak fishing. Every week, we'll have a special guest, whether it's a tournament angler, a content creator, or just a regular guy or girl who just loves to go kayak fishing. So grab a cold beer, sit back, and enjoy the show. Bass Kayak and Beers is sponsored in part by Douglas Rod. Go to douglasoutdoors.com to check out their full lineup and locate your nearest authorized dealer. Yak Gadget, made in America, based outside of Nashville, Tennessee. Yak Gadget offers all kinds of storage accessories, quick mount motor mounts, anchor systems, track mounted accessories, even paddles. Go to yakgadget.com and get your kayak decked out for your next trip out on the water. The 153 Bay Company, based in Troy, Ohio, make everything from plastics to custom painted hard baits. Hook them hard and hook them off. All of our baits are made to order and all of our hard baits are hand painted to order. So go to the153anglers.com to place your order today. So welcome to the Bass Kayak and Beers segment on the Paddle and Fin Network. Once again, thank you for joining us today. We've got a great episode, as always. I got Derek Taylor, who just uh, came out with the big W at the Cast Tournament in Choke Canyon, an impressive win. So glad to have you on, man. How you doing? Good, man. Appreciate you having me on. Uh, it's Second pleasure, podcast man. of the year. <laughs> yeah, I know. You well, got that big win. We were just talking about it on the pre-show, and I kind of wanted to have you over for that, but I think you were on either Paddle and Finn or KBN. Um, yeah, Paddle and Finn. Paddle and Finn, right? So I was mm-hmm. like, man, they beat me to it. But yeah, you and Brandon Miley put up a great show um, on the first. That was the first Cats tournament this year, right? That was the first event of the Texas Kayak Championship, the new big Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. TKC. Yeah, big payout. Right. yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so TKC. that was their first event. Yep. Yeah, definitely. That was that was, that was very impressive what you guys did. So, big props to you. And and I mean, you've had we talked a lot about the great anglers that we have in Texas. You know, Matt Scotch, um, Guillermo Gonzalez comes to mind. Um, Howell has you know, which I had last week on my podcast, has really stepped up not only on the local level but also on the national level. But I mean, for those that are not from Texas, kind of flies under the radar, and. Mm-hmm. The name of Derek Taylor. Now you've won Angler of the Year at the Cats, which is no easy feat. There's a lot of great anglers. Uh, Maccabi, and I always hope I pronounce his last name right, Jr. Um, Rolando Nandine. There's there's a bunch of great anglers competing at that tournament yeah. as well. And usually, um, Cats tournament has about a hundred anglers, so it's not like your typical 30, 40 anglers per tournament. You guys have like a hundred anglers each time out. Is that correct? Lately, it's been a little under 100, but a, few, a couple of years ago. I, yeah, I mean, there were times when they were up to like 150 or 160. So yeah. there are definitely times where it's big, but it's at least, you know, 50, 60 plus at a low showing. So, and like I said, it's it's a lot of good competition there. It's not even, that was my first time I actually won a Cats event. So I've won several other tournaments, but I've never won the Cats event. Um, just an actual Dan event. Dan, good I won Angler of the Year, but I never won first yeah. place in an event. I had a lot of second and thirds and fourths and whatnot that year, but never won. So that was cool. Speaks to the testament to, you know, again, the deep pool of anglers we have in Texas that are just great and awesome on what they're doing. And you mm-hmm. definitely um, should be, you know, should be noted that you're definitely one of them. And you put up a great show on the on Cho Canyon, man. Tell us a little bit about that. How did it how did it play it out for you? And what was your, you know, going into pre-fishing and then the tournament, you know, what worked for you and how hard was it for you to figure it out? Yeah. Um, I've never been to the lake ever. So I did a lot of research online, map study, YouTube videos, and kind of thought I was going into a lake that's going to be covered in grass. So I've heard it's a big punch in frog and lake. And I guess this recent freeze killed a lot of it off. There wasn't yeah. a whole lot of grass. It was real scattered. Um, which kind of made it a lot easier to fish, actually. Um, I was able to get on a good crankbait bite, which really separated out the medium fish and the big fish. Uh, But going into practice, I just found a boat ramp in the middle of the lake and just said, I'm just going to pick that ramp and just 
look at the area until I figure it out. Cause I've had times or at previous lakes where I want to go and look at too many different ramps and kind of just look at too much stuff and don't really break down the areas I'm fishing good enough. So I just picked a spot and had a really good practice. You probably caught up 102, almost 103 inches in practice wow. on all, all different kinds of baits um, on spook, swim jig, uh, 10 inch worm, crankbait, a bunch of stuff. I mean, everything I was catching was big. So I kind of thought I burnt up a lot of my big fish luck in the practice. Uh, so coming to the tournament, there was actually a few other boat tournaments that day launching out of the same launch we're at. So my first like five spots, there was boats and people all over it. So I ended up getting a little flustered first thing in the morning and I was catching some fish, but they're real small fish compared to practice. And I was like, well, but, you know, I burnt up my luck. Um, I had a small limit like mid eighties by like nine o'clock. And there was a few low nineties, a lot of high eighties at that point. So I knew I was in it and then made a switch over um, from the square bill. I was throwing just a shad color that wasn't getting good bites. I switched over to a DT 10, a little more natural color and immediately caught a 20 and then caught a 24 and a half, then a 20 and a quarter and a 20 and a quarter and just started calling everything. And then I don't know how many 17, 18 inches I caught on that crankbait that I just threw back, but I was on the main lake point and there's probably like four or five underwater points out on this main lake point stretch. And I believe there are shell beds on there because I could feel the shell bed when I was cranking it. But there was also little patches of hydrilla out there and the wind was just ripping in on it. And so I was catching them certain ways. But for some reason, when I picked up that certain crankbait, the bites just got huge. And pretty much it was game over after I picked that crankbait up. So I went up to 99, 102, and then all the way up to 103 and three quarter. And at that point, I think I had a, a really big lead. So I will kind of slow down because my arms were cramping actually from cranking and catching so many fish. I slowed down and threw a Nico rig for a while just to let my arms rest. And and then as I got my strength back, I start cranking again and call another fish. And it was, it's an awesome lake. Yeah, I definitely want to go back. <laughs> yeah, I bet you would. Between, <laughs> yeah. between pre-fishing and fishing, and what was that, like uh, 205 inches? Yeah, definitely. At least, yeah. How did yeah, you find – what, how did you find those spots, you know, when you're talking about main lake points, we're talking about, you know, underwater humps or just. So there are points that come off of the main lake and the channel actually swings up to the bank. So there's 30 foot of water, you know, 10, 20 yards away from these points. And I'm catching them in like, you know, three to eight foot of water any, anywhere in there. But I think that main lake uh, channel coming right up to there is what kept it replenishing and kept the bigger fish coming in. Uh, so especially in the summertime now, like when I'm breaking down the lake, I definitely want to have deep water close where I'm fishing uh, for those post-spawn fish that are coming out. And, yeah. and there still may be some pre-spawn fish coming in. In Texas, you, they just spawn so long here. Um, but I like to f get more main lake oriented on all the lakes I fish. Um, if it's in the fall type deal, I like to go further back in the creeks or if it's like heavy in the spawn. But even in the spawn, I like to find stuff on main lake. It just seems like the fishing, the fish quality better and more fish. And I just like that kind of stuff better. So it's just one of those things where you, your game plan is pretty much what you would do on pretty much any similar lake. It wasn't anything that yeah. you're like, on this lake, I'm going to apply this. No, this is kind of like, this is kind of like riding your wheelhouse. This is what you would have done. I mean, obviously every lake is different but that's that was yeah. your strategy going in yeah and this lake fish is a lot like other lakes i fish it reminded me a lot of lake buchanan which i fish a lot and do really well out there uh, just the way that the fish kind of feed off the wind direction and pile up in certain areas but they're very um tricky because one day like practice day i was catching them on big worms and swim jigs and stuff like that and a spook in the tournament day it was overcast and i thought the spook bite was going to be crazy but it wasn't, and the only thing they were eating really good was that crankbait. So it took me until 9.30 to really figure it out and then get them dialed in. So you, you were throwing a D, a DT-10, which a is six. That, a 6. Oh, okay, okay. I thought you said yeah. that. Okay. So you're throwing a, you know, a medium-driving crankbait, kind of around 6 feet, 
and about yeah. three inches of three inches, three feet of water, right? Just banging it on the against the, the shell beds and the rocks. Yeah. So um, when I wasn't banging on the shell bed itself, I would throw it out a little deeper and there's grass out there. So I was ripping it through hydrilla. So I would get most of my bites in the grass too, actually. Um, but I mean, every single cast, if I didn't catch one, I was pulling hydrilla off of my crankbait. So, I mean, it was real tedious. And if you're not catching them very fast, I can see how that would scare a lot of anglers away because like, you know, I'm tired of ripping this grass off. This ain't worth it. But I mean, they got on it so fast that I knew that was the deal. So I was ripping grass off that crankbait all day. Were you surprised after being after pre-fishing for a hundred and you know, like you said, you got like a hundred and two inches on pre-fishing? Were you surprised, you know, at the result you got on on tournament day, being you know switching your, um, you know, going from okay, they're biting on everything now they're biting on crankbaits. Were you surprised by nine thirty when you started changing your game plan? You're thinking, um, this is not starting the way pre-fishing yeah. started and then he picked up did that surprise you or is this something that you expected i kind of expected it because everything was going perfect in practice so i know you know if i wouldn't have got that yeah. one bite on a swim jig and whatever those big fish i caught a lot of 17 or 18 so i knew i had a chance of catching like mid upper 80s like there's a really good chance of going out and catching that but i knew there was big fish there too so i knew the possibility of going big was there uh, but really the boat traffic and the boat tournaments is what kind of got me thrown off at the beginning because I'd want to jump to the next spot and there's a boat on it and I'd go to the next spot to check it and there's a boat on it. And so that was kind of getting me, had a little negative mindset probably around nine <clears throat> when I had just mid eighties, but I was still happy because I had fun the day before and, you know, it was a new lake. I told myself I just wanted to win it. But then after that big practice, you know, I kind of raised my expectations a little bit, but tried not to raise them too much based on that practice. No, definitely. Um, what, uh, what to, you know, to get to, to where you, to where you got that result, um, how frustrating was it just starting off and then not being able to, you know, because the tournament starts at 6 a.m. and then 9.30 is where you kind of, if I understood right, that's when the bike started getting, you know, more realistic for you that says, okay, I can win this. So how frustrating was it just from where it started till when the, when, when the tournament started to where the bike got real for you? I mean, it was frustrating, but I feel like that's one of my best features is I don't let things really get me too high or too low. Um, I mean, you can ask plenty of my friends who are, you know, that do those tournaments that I'm really good when there's a lot of people around and a lot of distractions and things like that. I don't really let it bother me. So at that point, I mean, I was just a little negative thinking, all right, I'm not going to win it, but I still can get a respectable limit, you know, mm. leave here with my head up high. Um, but then, you know, once I started catching those big fish, I was like, wait a minute. All right. And then once I caught the second big one, which is that giant, I was like, okay, we're, we could already win just on that fish. And then they just kept coming the big one. So, it was easy after that. Speaking of, let's take a look at this because that thing is. Let me see if I can do share screen here. Uh, that thing is just a massive football. Look at that. Is the, are your hands that small or is the fish that big? <laughs> no, I mean, it, it was almost it, it was 24 and three quarter, but I could I'd have to pinch the tail a little bit, so I only got 24 and a half. Um, but I ended up weighing it. It was eight eight, but I thought it was going to be a nine plus because it was very thick as long as well with that. And I had a Tyler Howes actually out on the same point that I was and came over and took some pictures of it for me. So that was cool. Yeah, that is a massive. I I I mean, it took I can't me a long that... time to get that in. Well, you caught I'm it on 12... the crankbait. Yeah, on that DT six 12 pound line. I mean, it took, 12 pound line. I God, I yeah, I don't know how many runs of drag, you know, it took when I would get it close to the net and about to net it and then it would take off pill and drag. And I keep my, my uh, drag very loose on my crankbait setups because I, I love fishing that way. And I catch a lot of good ones on Fayette that way. So I know to keep that drag very loose and my arms are cramping before I got that thing in the net. It was fighting so hard. It was pretty cool. Yeah, that that's an adventure. How worried were you when you when you feel that bite? When you realize you haven't seen it yet, or maybe you have, but you do realize, okay, this is a this is a big fish. 
Definitely so, a big fish. And I have a 12 pound test line. So the way I'm it was fighting at first, yeah, I was at first I thought it was a carp because it was going straight down and never came up and jumped. It was just pulling drag so hard going straight down. I was like, I either got a huge catfish or a carp. And one time it kind of swirled at the surface and I didn't see it great. So I was like, oh, that was a giant carp. And then after a while it came up again. I was like, holy shit, this is an ass. And then things got real serious and I started trying to take my time and playing it a little bit more and stuff. And it was a crazy fight. Probably the longest bass fight I ever did. How long do you say it took? Like five minutes? I mean, it was. It felt like forever. It had to have been at least a couple of minutes. I mean, it was a long time. And Tyler sat there and watched me the whole time. And he even said he thought I was hooked into a cart because I fought it for so long. How how does your strategy change? Okay, you feel the bite. You know, we set the hook and we start reeling in and, you know, fighting the fish. But all of a sudden, you come to a realization, this is not your ordinary bass. And then you realize, I can't lose this. How does that change from, let's say, I got a 15-inch bass or a 17-inch bass or an 18-inch bass to, crap, I got something that's way above the 20-inch that's going to get me at least, you know, you're thinking at least big bass, you know, give me – let me catch. It'll get me catch a check. Does anything change in the approach that you're gonna really mean? Are you are you being more careful? Are you being more aggressive to make sure you you don't let him get off? What, how do you change your game plan when you realize you have something more than ordinary bass? I mean, I try to stay pretty locked in most of the time. Obviously, when you when you hook into something like that, you just try to stay as focused as you can. You want to. Be aware of your surroundings. You don't want to, you know, get too close to any kind of structure that could jeopardize getting that fish in. And make sure your drag's right. Um, any close pulls around the boat, you want to click the button and feather it. I'm really good at that because it's even with your drag loose. If they take a hard enough pull under the boat, they can pop that line. Uh, so at that point, I mean, you're just trying to keep it down, keep it from jumping and playing it soft. Because uh, I mean, I didn't even upgrade the hooks on that crankbait. I normally do and. I didn't lose one fish that day. So, a lot, I mean, you're either going to get it in or you're not. You try to do all the things right. And there's been times where I've done it all right and lost those fish in big boat tournaments as well. And yeah, I've been on both ends of that. This one, this year, really, I've been able to land the big fish. So, that's been a big key. Yeah, that's that is a massive, massive fish. Congratulations on it. I'm assuming that one big bass of the day. Right? <laughs> no, it didn't. A, really? Somebody caught, a, somebody caught a 25 inch that was almost 10 pounds. <laughs> yeah. Really? Oh, uh -huh. my God. There well, you go. Texas showing up as always. Choking. Wow. It's a crazy place. Who do you, is there anybody out there, not to say idolize, but to that you really look up to as an angler that you in here in Texas, you say like, man, I want to get to that level. Um, kayak wise, there's not really anyone that I feel like that. I feel like I want to be that person kayak wise, but in boat scene, um, there's some guides around Texas, like Charles Whitehead. He's a major guy in Texas and I fish against him a lot in boat tournaments. And he's definitely taking my money a lot more times than I've taken his and, he, he gets a fish for a living. He guides every day and, and wins these tournaments left and right. So at some point, when, once I have enough money saved up, I'm just going to guide and, uh, and then do fish tournaments on the weekends. That's definitely my retirement plan. That's a good retirement plan. <laughs> no yeah. shame in that retirement plan. Good yeah. luck with that, man. Thank so you. let me ask you this now. Um, you've won the Cats Tournament Angle of the Year. I haven't followed your career um, to you know, to comment on any other any other angle of the year tournaments that if you won, or any other tournaments that if you won that you're proud of that you want to kind of like reserve recognition. Yeah, I've got two angle of the years before this one, and um, a different trail that doesn't go on anymore. Um, that one was Texas Fishing League, or one of those um, a few years back where I tied an angle of the year and then one angle of the year, and then one angle of the year. This is my. The 2019 was my first time fishing the full year of cats in one angle of the year in that one. Um, and I've done a lot of TTZ boat tournaments and got up in the top five in those a few times. And that's really, really stout competition there. Um, but got a win on Buchanan and a Hobie Bass Open that qualified me for the Tournament of Champions. 
that year that I won Angler of the Year. So I went and fished the Wachita in Arkansas. There, that was really fun. Uh, have that's really my next goal is to win a big tournament on the national level. I've won several in the big Texas tournaments, which is hard enough to win itself. Yeah. Um, so I would like to get on that national stage, but I got an eight month old kid, so I didn't get to fish as much this year as I did that year. I won angler of the year. So anytime I can go fish, even if I don't only get one day or no days of practice, I'm happy. and It's been paying off so far. No, and definitely family comes first, you know, it's, uh, yeah. that's more, way more important than catching dumb fish. <laughs> and yeah. I say that to put it in perspective, obviously we all love it. How do you feel like when we look at and we talked about other anglers? I mean, we, we talked about it in Texas, Guillermo Gonzalez, Matt Scotch, you know, Howell. Um, and we talk about national level, Ross Snyder, Christine Fisher, Jody Quinn. But being honest and not trying to, you know, keep yourself humble or anything like that, just being, you know, raw and honest. How do you feel you compare yourself to some of those big names? I mean, I think the skill, we all have very, very similar skill levels. It comes down to, I mean, there's a lot of luck that plays into that. You go and pre-fish the right area, you know, on the first day, or if you have five days of pre-fish, you know, you might be more likely to do better. So, I mean, I think there's so many people that are on that same level with those guys you mentioned in the, you know, like in the Cats Trail and all the different trails in Texas. Um, when it gets to that point, I mean, it's anybody's game, the way I feel about it. Those a um, couple of those guys you mentioned are definitely in Christine are definitely I would consider, you know, to be in that top echelon um, along with a lot of those guys in Texas. No, definitely. I mean, and the world deserves of the accolades. And it's one of those things where, you know, it's I'm sure every region, if you go upstate New York, you'll find great. Uh, kayak bass anglers in Arkansas, California, everywhere. Mm -hmm. um, Texas obviously gets a lot of recognition because, you know, there's big bass, but there's also a big fishing culture here, you know, yeah. that is maybe you get a bigger bass, I think, in Florida. But I don't think in Florida, there's a lot of great anglers in Florida. But you don't get that fishing culture. Like when you go to Lake Fork and in and, and some of these historic lakes that we have here in Texas, you can feel the culture. Like the whole town is just about fishing and bass fishing. And I think that plays a lot into, you know, some of the great, you know, whether it's bo um, boat anglers or kayak anglers that come out of Texas, it's there's the talent level is so rich here just because. Not only is it that it's Big Bass Factory in a lot of this, like OHIV comes to mind. We saw mm -hmm. what um, Jody Quinn and Guillermo Gonzalez did on uh, Eagle Mountain Lake, which really flies under the radar um, compared yeah. to other great lakes around here and produces bass, I mean, massive bass fish. Um, but there's also that culture, like the, the Texas culture is really submerged in bass fishing so much. And there's lakes here everywhere. Yeah, you can go throw a stone in any direction. You'll find a, you'll, you'll hit five lakes that have great bass fishing. Yeah, and it's just so much more popular these days. So the number yeah. of people fishing is growing, and more people are just sticking with it. And since it's been popular for you know four or five years now, there's just so many people that's been doing it long enough to get to that level where they can win, you know, in any kind of lake. Definitely. Well, Derek, first of all, thank you so much for joining us. Um, I know you have uh, family to attend to, and we want to keep this segment short, but I really do appreciate you taking time to join us. Uh, before I let you go, uh, we talked about it a little bit on the pre-show. A lot of stuff has been said about the cast tournament and some fish that a lot of fish apparently were disqualified this week. And there's been some, I don't want to say drama, controversy, but there's been some other stuff you know, I think early in the year in the cast tournaments, there was somebody was caught cheating um, and other fish disqualified in other tournaments. What's your general thought uh, on the cast tournament? I know you love cast tournament. I've seen your post. I actually, you reposted today about how you felt about the cast tournament when you won Angler of the Year last year and you thought it was one of the best runs. 
um, kayak fishing tournaments. Um, for those that don't know the cats tournament and then only going by all the negative stuff that being thrown out on social media, especially this week, what are your thoughts on the cats cats tournament? I mean, it's been around. It's probably the longest, you know, tenured trail out there. It's been through its different directors and whatnot. Um, I think Caden is doing a, a good job. He, he's passionate about it. He's friends with all the anglers. Um, he's got to stick by the rules on these photo submissions because there's a lot of stuff that's been going on and you got to be on top of that. And, you know, he, it's just as like, it's just as likely for him to, to be talked about because he isn't holding up to these rules, you know, as much as he is holding up to them. So it's a tournament director is not an easy job. I think he's doing a great job. Um, anyone who wants to think negative of it or think I'm not going to fish that trail because of this or that. I mean, I, to me, that's just a sorry excuse. I don't care if the tournament director is, you know, half blind. Uh, I'm going to fish a tournament. I'm going to read the rules and know what to do and what not to do. If I get a fish DQ'd, it's probably my fault for not reading the rules. And I'm way too competitive to not fish a, a trail because of, you know, someone talking bad about it. So I'm going to be out there every time trying to take care of everybody's money. Definitely. And, and you know, like I said, there's a lot of things that were said, um, especially in some of the rules that I, and again, I reached out to Ken and I wanted to get his thoughts on it. I don't know why. Apparently the original catch board is not um, allowed, but yet the Hawk Throb, which has brought a lot of controversy, especially in, te in Texas, where we had the Hobie BOS, and I think it was 2019, kind of like there. the camel that, yeah, the camel that broke the, let me see, the straw that broke the camel's back when it comes to the Hawk Throb and th stuff that was going on. I personally think they should get rid of the, the Hawk Throb for tournaments, especially when we're talking about historical tournament like cats. Um, yeah. But that's just my opinion. Now, why is it the reason? I don't understand the reason why that catch board was not allowed. I don't know if it was that fish that, that got DQ'd. It was that particular catch board. There was something wrong with that particular catch board. I think it just wasn't one of the approved ones. It's yeah. Like they said you can use this one, that one, or that one. And it wasn't one yeah. of the ones they laid out. So, you know. But having said that, it is, you know, regardless. I've read the rules and I think some of it's a little strict, like the whole thing can't, you know, you can't put your hand or thumb beyond the, the anal fin. That's if you have a 12 inch or 13 inch bass, that's kind of hard to do. Me personally, I don't even touch the fish. I just come down, take the picture and keep my hands out of it. But that's just me. That's just my personal preference. I do have to say, you know, it's on the anglers to check out the rules, read them and abide by them. Um, yeah. You can't always put it on the tournament director. And I don't know, Candem, I've people that I've talked to um on social media and talked to anglers talked to personally all have nothing but great things to say about Candem and the job that he's doing. Um, and you know, some of them don't agree with the rules, but they have a lot of respect for Candem. So I don't want to make I don't want to make this very clear. We're not here to um bash on Candem or you know, or um what, what's the word I'm looking for? I mean, you know, question his character or his, you know, his capabilities uh, or as a tournament director. There is just some rules that apparently has gone a little bit more negative attention that you would have liked as a tournament director. Um, and it is what it is. It's easy to play armchair tournament director for any one of us, but it's a lot harder to try. And I think what he does is, you know, he's trying to make sure the 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 sport stays clean, especially when it comes to cats. So props yeah, to him he, for the job that he's doing. He listens to everybody and, and actually and thinks about it. And it's a, if that's a valid point and then he'll, ch you know, he can change his mind on things if you give him, you know, a good argument. So he's not just black and white, you know, he he's open to discussion and changing things. And that's really what you want in a director. You know, if, if someone don't like something, tell them about it, he'll try to fix it. So. And trans yeah, and like you said, transparency. Uh, you know, you want transparency between the, what the tournament director is doing, how he's applying the rules. And yeah, you need. You mean you hit the nail on the head with that comment. So, anyways, Ken, um, Ken and Derek, thank you so much for joining us. Before I let you go, um, anybody you want to thank? I mean, I don't know if you have any sponsors, family members, anybody yep. you want to shout out to. Yep, sponsor uh, Leviathan Rods. Um, 
that's what I catch a lot of my big fish on the custom crankbait rods, the bunch of swim bait rods, uh, fat lip baits, um, help me get a lot of baits. Uh, it gets thanks to my fiance for taking care of our son while I get to go practice and fish these tournaments. Cause without her, I would definitely not be fishing any of them this year. Uh, so thank you, Bianca for that. And thanks for all these directors out here running these trails that it's not the fun job, but I get the fun part. Yeah. Especially when you get to catch a check, right? Yep. Yep. <laughs> that helps. Keeps everybody happy. Congratulations yep. on your engagement. Um, thank you. We're, uh, we're, it's, it's hard to get, you know, plan a wedding right now with this whole pandemic, but yep. hopefully things will clear out and you get to enjoy, you know, your wedding and, you know, get all oh, by then, hopefully this whole mess will be over with and, yeah. and you can enjoy it. So congratulations on your engagement. Thank you. Thanks for having me on too. No problem, man. It's my pleasure. And uh, thank you again for taking time. I'll let you go so you can uh, enjoy time with your family. And for those out there listening, thank you for joining us. Remember, go check out my sponsor, DouglasOutdoors.com to check out the full lineup of LRS rods and x Matrix rocks. Thank you again. Hope you have a great day. If you're going to be on the water, wear your PFDs. Stay safe. Peace, y'all. Appreciate it. Peace. Thanks for tuning in to another killer episode on Paddle in Finn. Don't forget to go check out our website at paddle, the letter N, and fin.com. Don't forget to check out the YouTube channel at Paddle in Finn. If you got a question, comment, want to hear from a future guest on a future episode, feel free to email us at paddle, the letter N, and fin at gmail.com. Don't forget to follow us on social media at Paddle and Finn on Facebook and Instagram. Shout out to our show supporters, Angler, the Angler Button and app just makes for a better time on the water and creates a virtual logbook for every fishing outing out on the water shout out to rocktown adventures located in northern illinois for all your kayaking camping and hiking needs shout out to jig masters jigs when in doubt get the jig out go to jigmasters.com